The crows brought out the crazy in my dad. He was a bird watcher in later life, setting out an avian banquet every morning on our porch, the nuts here, the mixed seeds there, the thistles in this feeder, the sunflower seeds in that feeder, the suet, the oranges, the leftover toast, the bread crusts, etc., etc. The birds and the squirrels and the rabbits flooded our backyard and porch. We weren't really gardeners, so the rabbits were welcomed. The squirrels were tolerated, though a standard Christmas gift for Dad every year was the newest squirrel-proofed, candelevered bird feeder. But the crows, Dad couldn't abide the crows and the ways that they bullied the songbirds and chased them away. The biggest hint that he had lost his mind over the crows was when we found him sitting in a hidden part of the porch with a handgun in his lap. <laughs> now, to be fair, it was really a glorified BB gun. And with Dad's failing eyesight, there was little or no chance that he would actually hit any of the crows. And even if he had, the BB would just barely nudge them aside. But there he was, sitting up vigilantly, gun in lap, eyes squinted in a kind of Clint Eastwood-like grim determination. Go ahead, crows, make my day. <laughs> he had gone nuts, and the crows had driven him to it. Dad's dilemma wasn't anything new. Crows have long been the nemesis of the human race. Think of all the old folk tales and ancient mythological stories where crows are the embodiment of devilry, even evil. And down through human history, many attempts have been made to counter that persistent gluttony and and bullying of the crows. The scarecrow, of course, is the best known example of that. But the most creative solution I came across in human history, it seems to me, came from a native tribe who was trying to keep the, the crows away from their corn. So they tied strings of thread to kernels of corn and fastened the other ends of the, of the string to the ground. So when the crows swallowed the corn, they were trapped. They'd be fluttering helplessly, unable to fly away. Instead of the crows eating the native corn, this tribe of native people ate the crows. Now, I wonder if that image shouldn't remind us this morning that every temptation has a string attached to it. And the foolish person, like a greedy crow, doesn't notice the string until they try to fly away. When Satan tempted Jesus in the passage from Matthew, he offered him three patently good things, food, power, and faith. But each of these gifts came with a string attached, didn't it? All of us are tempted, and like Jesus, the choices we are offered aren't always clear-cut. It's easy to choose between the truly good and the patently bad, but this passage takes Jesus and us into a much murkier realm, a wilderness place of temptation where choices are not clear and it's easy to get caught by the strings attached. There is a wilderness. There's a wilderness in our lives, a place where we're alone, vulnerable, confused, lost. We think of big events as being evidence of that wilderness or casting us into that wilderness, depression, disease, divorce, death. And indeed, those are significant times and places of wilderness in our lives. Those are our Gethsemane moments when we cry and we pray and we struggle to say, not my will, but your will be done, God. In fact, however, the wilderness is always there sometimes in the space between one day and another, one hour and another, one moment and another. The wilderness isn't just big moments and big decisions, but small moments, small decisions, the not-so-clear ones that face us every day. There's a, there's a telling moment in the movie The Paper when the very pregnant newspaper reporter wife turns to her husband, the very driven city editor. She's frantic with worry that he won't be able to detach himself from his crazy devotion to his work to care for her, 
and for their child when it comes. It's been their routine throughout the movie to pose hypothetical questions to one another, so she does it one more time. What would you do, she asks him, if a terrorist broke into the newspaper office with a bomb and held a gun to my head? Choose the paper or your wife, he would say. Which would you choose? The husband says, you're crazy. I would never be offered a choice like that. Exactly, she says. We're never offered one big choice, but we're offered little choices every day. And how we choose them ends up making a big choice. Little choices. That's what we're offered. Little choices every day. If we're wise, like Jesus, we will always examine our temptations carefully and look for the string attached to them. Because add up all those little strings and what you end up being is somebody tied up in knots. It couldn't hurt to skip out of work or school just this once. It couldn't hurt to fudge the numbers just this once. It couldn't hurt to lie to a friend just this once. It couldn't hurt not to tell my spouse where I've really been just this once. It couldn't hurt to take out my frustration on the kids just this once. It couldn't hurt to take a drink, take a puff, have a fling, just this once. It couldn't hurt to have my will rather than God's will make this decision, just this once. But it does hurt, doesn't it? It's like Mae West once said, I used to be Snow White, but I drifted. Give in to little temptations enough and suddenly you're drifted. You've given in to a lifestyle you never meant to choose. You end up with a life you never wanted and can't be proud of. Like the Hebrews with Moses, you're lost in a wilderness of sin. <laughs> Once several members of an acidic congregation had become hopelessly lost in a dense forest. They were delighted when unexpectedly they came upon their rabbi, who was also wandering through the forest. They implored him, Master, we're lost. Please show us the way out of the forest. The rabbi replied, I don't know the way out either, but I do know which paths lead nowhere. I will show you the paths that don't work, and then perhaps together we can discover the ones that do. Maybe following the example of Jesus means to first refuse to follow the bad paths, the false paths, the ones that lead nowhere, to refuse to accept the false gifts that sorely tempt us. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. That's the, the message that emerges at the end of our passage. That's the message that Jesus carries out of the wilderness and into the wilderness everyday lives of those to whom he has been sent. Repent. You know that comes from the Greek word metanoia, which means literally to turn. And, and remember, turning involves two things, turning away from something and turning toward something. Well, repentance involves both. What do you need to turn away from? What are the temptations that have captured you? What, have tied, what has tied you into knots? that's caused you to drift and get lost in the woods of your life. How many of us know people we both love and admire who can't seem to turn away from destructive impulses and behavior? What do you, what do you need to turn away from? Those false, nowhere-leading paths. More importantly, what do you need to turn toward? What does it mean for you to turn toward the kingdom of heaven? There's a, there's a wonderful quote from Evelyn Underhill, an English woman and scholar who in the 1920s and 1930s, when women were not allowed to become ordained clergy in the Church of England, did them one better. She became a teacher of clergy. One of Evelyn Underhill's quotes speaks deeply to me of what it means to turn toward the kingdom of heaven. A modern saint has said, 
with the directness and simplicity of the saints, that the bread of life seldom has any butter on it. I like that expression. The bread of life seldom has any butter on it. And she goes on. And this is just so because it is life and not a lovely dream or a heavenly vision. A life which is full of tension and of difficulty and full of opportunities for heroic choice and for sacrifice. What does it mean to turn toward the kingdom of heaven? Well, I agree with Underhill. I don't believe the kingdom of heaven is the butter of our lives. It isn't the extravagant, the ecstatic, the supernatural, the super emotional. I believe it's present in the bread, in the very ordinary stuff of our lives, the daily work, the frequent friends, the ordinary signs of love and affection. It's in our living, it's in our trying, it's in our hoping, it's in our dying. It's, that's where God is, not somewhere else, some higher plane of existence, right here, right now. Isn't that what Jesus told us? The kingdom of heaven has come near So, what is this repentance that can free us from our temptations? I believe it's the daily, even moment-to-moment discipline of turning away from some things and turning towards and looking for God in the midst of our lives, looking for wonder, looking for hope, looking for kindness, looking for joy, looking for every opportunity we can find to offer those very same gifts to others in sacrifice, in service, in sincerity of heart and intention. Yes, sometimes that turning towards God involves turning away from that which dazzles, distracts, or drags us down. In all things, it means turning, however slightly we can do it, towards God. And remember what we will find when we turn towards God. Jesus spent his lifetime trying to tell us what we would find. A loving father who welcomes the prodigal home. A shepherd who rejoices in finding a lost sheep, a woman who throws a party when she finds a lost coin, an employer who gives us full wages no matter how late we join the work. What we find is a loving God who forgives us before the words of confession can even form on our lips, who can see and rejoice in our turnings no matter how small they may be. We find a God who in Jesus Christ was not the butter of our lives, but the very bread and substance of who we are and what we can be. That's what we'll find. Therefore, repent, turn. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Amen.